On BBC Two shortly, the Money Programme features a report on the Financial Services Act. Next on 999, trapped on a sinking ship, could the rescuers save themselves? The massive explosion that left a woman buried under tons of rubble. A wasp sting that might have meant certain death. And even in peaceful Devon, accidents can happen. Heroism and bravery, 999, Tuesday at 9.30 on BBC One. I want the money. The cloud thickens tonight. We will see outbreaks of rain almost everywhere, except maybe in Shetland. And there could still be the vestiges of the odd uh, thunderstorm rumbling around. The heaviest rain not likely to reach, I don't think, the western part of the country until the early hours of the morning. And of course, with that blanket of cloud, it's, it's going to be a fairly mild night and fairly humid as well, especially down in England and in Wales. We start then with a gloomy morning, not so good if you're on the roads. Most of the rain will still be light at this stage, except maybe over parts of Wales. However, Northern Ireland's completely different. You might well find the rain disappear and have a couple of hours of very nice, fine weather. Now that rain is going to hang around through northern Scotland and down through East Anglia and the southeast of England, probably until dusk. It will clear gradually eastwards from the rest of the country. There will be a lot of cloud following though, a few breaks in it, and later on in the day we'll see a few light showers running onto the coasts in a fairly brisk westerly wind. And it's that that's going to make the flavour of the day feel different, apart from the rain of course. Temperatures are average, and they're much the same as they've been today, but if you're in the wind it's going to feel quite cool. You'll need to be sheltered to get any benefit from that. On to Thursday, we're in a run of westerly winds now. That's good for drying hay, for example, but it also brings a lot of showers. Now, we still have the, the front along the north, so further rain for northern Scotland, and most of the showers are going to be down the western side. A few will go across the Pennines, maybe, a few up the Bristol Channel. But on the eastern side of the country, it won't be so bad. But it is breezy, and again, average temperatures, it's not going to feel that good. Bit of a change on Friday, an interruption, more rain running into the southwest. BBC Two shortly ventures into a private world of guilty encounters and broken vows. Adultery, a new four-part series of frank and personal stories. Fletcher, I want you to sail with me again. Agreed. God! They were friends. I have determined that the bounty shall not lose a single man. Halfway around the world, a single man was in danger of losing much more. It was the place itself. It's a warning. Oh, there are rumblings, are there? No. There is fear. If I were you, I'd take the ship. Why don't you then? I said if I were you. The Bounty, tonight at 10.20 on BBC One. And before tonight's film, Michael Burke with Tales of Bravery Beyond the Call of Duty. All of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors and stuntmen, but everything you see and hear is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct events as they happen. Tonight on 999, trapped on a sinking ship, could the rescuers save themselves? The massive explosion that left a badly injured woman buried under tons of rubble. And how you could help save a life yourself. It's training that makes for a professional approach to search and rescue and saving lives, a routine of action that identifies priorities and gets the job done, so that in all the confusion and the panic, that routine takes over. But occasionally, that pattern breaks down, and what happens then is as much about individual bravery and personal resourcefulness as it is about discipline. That and sometimes friendship and trust, too. In this rescue, which we've reconstructed, two Navy divers put their lives very much on the line trying to save others. They'd worked together for years, but what happened that day won them both the George Medal. Security! Security! All 
ships, all ships, all ships. This is the Murray, the Murray. We have lost two containers overboard. The position I don't the think I'd have liked to go that close or see any of my uh, lads or anything that close ever again. We took it right to the edge. We couldn't take it any closer. Mr. Murray, I am now losing drums and cases of the deck. I'm taking on water at the forward end. Looking at the debris that was around the vessel and the way the containers were breaking off and how fast she seemed to be going down, at that point, I did not think we were going to make it. I didn't think we were all going to get off alive. Brixham Coast Guard, this is the Murray. We need assistance. Murray, this is Brixham Coast Guard. Understand you need immediate assistance. Scrambling the helicopters now. When the Mayday call first came in from the Pakistani container ship, the MV Marie, rescue helicopter crews at Coldrose thought just 14 crew members were trapped on board. They were to find the ship sinking fast, 15 miles off the Devon coast, and a bigger emergency than they'd thought. As soon as I saw the vessel, I knew that the vessel would not probably stay afloat for much longer. By that, I mean there's a lot of white water, the waves breaking on each other, and the large containers that were on the front of the vessel were just being washed off like as if they were matchboxes. We, by this time, had realised there was more people on the vessel than we first thought. Initially, we thought there was 14 on there. We then were told that it was 40 people on board. Um, so, obviously, we knew that we had to move quickly to get the guys off. In gale force winds of more than 60 miles an hour, the helicopter pilots needed all their skill and concentration to stay in a stable enough position to get a man on board. Some of the Marie's crew had their families with them, women and children, who had to be rescued first. It was really a nightmare for us, what happened. Because at that moment, at the time of accident, we did not realize the graveness of the danger. We did not know that we were so close to death and we were just taking it as an adventure, you see. Navy diver Steve Wright was sent down. It was very hard to communicate, but a lot of shouting, gesticulating, and angry looks on the face. You can get most people to do as you want. Placed one female and a child into a uh, grip, a bag that I, I carried with me, and we winched those into the aircraft. That way I could get two people up, but having a good eye on the child, if you like, rather than leaving the child suspended with a female above the sea on her own. My wife didn't want to leave me because uh, she said, well, if you, if you are going to die, we'll die together. But I, I made her and the other officers. I was busy with the captain, so uh, the, other, the third officers, they forced her and they were, she was hoisted. The winching operation went on until all but 10 of the crew and their families were safe. More help arrived to help speed the evacuation. Another helicopter carrying Steve's partner, Dave Wallace. After getting off all those people, I was getting really quite tired now. To see Dave come down to the, the vessel was quite a relief to myself because I needed the help. And it was. It was nice to see my buddy come down, not only to assist, but as a morale boost to myself. Now Dave was able to take over the winching. Steve could go forward to find the ship's radio room and tell the Coast Guards what was happening. Brixham Coast Guard, Brixham Coast Guard. This is Rescue 193's diver on the bridge of the Murray. We have 10 persons, I say again, 10 persons left to evacuate, plus two divers. This ship will sink imminently. Steve came back and he sort of said, we're going to have to get a shift on. He said, what's something? He said, you want to see it from up the front there? He said, it is murder. He said, it's white water down there. And that was one of the first times for a while that I'd actually looked down the front end and could see the, it was like surf, if you like, just bubbling up and boiling up towards us. Um, and with this rumbling and that underneath, we knew that she was starting to take in a lot of water and quite fast. 
had already decided that if we were in the short time, Steve and I would be the last two to leave so that we just have each other to take care of, don't have to worry about anybody else. The last two went up just as they got into the doorway of the aircraft. The ship gave an almighty lurch with a nose down and the back end came straight out the water. I knew then that we were in trouble, that we'd cut it too fine, really. That was really the first uh, notion in my mind that we might not get away with it. Dave and Steve grabbed the back rail as the deck fell away beneath them. He went to almost vertical within the space of 15 seconds and we knew the ship was going down very quickly and there was just no way I could get the winch wire down to them quick enough. The high line transfer, which is a piece of rope that we used to steady the winch wire, got wrapped around an obstruction on the ship and I had to tell them to jump. I just shouted to see you move, just go for it. This is it, mate. Go for it. So I turned to Dave and, and said goodbye to him. And uh, he replied that he'd see me on the other side. And it was at that point that I uh, launched myself from the side of the vessel. And that is really the first time that I'd realised the height that we were going to have to jump. I was just in his head disappear down. I had a quick look up to the forward end, could see all this white water, but my big worry was uh, boxes and debris in the water looked, found I had a clear area, and just jumped for it. I didn't know, I mean, we knew it was high, but uh, from the guys in the aircraft who obviously had their height indications and they said it was 90 feet, we'd actually jumped into the water. The water went from boiling white, if you like, the white froth on the surface to a dark colored green, darker green, and eventually it actually went black where I couldn't remember seeing anything in front of my face. I started getting this fear about being dragged down with the ship, because as I looked over my right shoulder, I could actually see the ship disappearing past me. I could actually reach out and touch it, but it actually moved down the side of me. I remember seeing the rust color going past me. It did seem to go down a long way. And as I came to the surface, um, it was at that point that I thought, I'm still alive. And I, I found it quite hard to believe, really, that I was still alive and quite relieved. I realised how close I still was to the ship, wondering if I'd get away. I actually had a, quite a big thought for my wife and my two children that I honestly, at that stage, thought I would never see them again. I thought, this is it. And I remember actually saying out loud, sorry, Carol, Kiss the kids for me, but this is it. I mean, we're talking, God, two and a half years after it, but just the thought of being in the water and saying bye-bye to the kids, it nearly makes me cry every time I say it out loud. On the helicopter, Nigel Toms managed to free the winch and was manoeuvring to come in to get them. My immediate thought was that I had to get them both cleared of the vessel very quickly. The pilot luckily had visual reference with the ship, so he was able to keep us safe away from the side of the ship as he went underwater. Once I was visual with them, I went to the closest one, directing the pilot over the head him and lowered the winch wire, which was by then free. The winch hook, it just appeared in front of me, hooked my harness on, had a quick look round and then could see Steve. Now, at that stage, I didn't know if Nigel had already spotted him, but I pointed out the direction of where Steve was and signaled to them in the aircraft that I wanted to go and get him first before being winched into the aircraft. I connected myself to the winch wire and uh, we must admit we give ourselves a, a little bit of a cuddle and, and we're very pleased to see each other, although there was, uh, yeah, we we're very pleased to see each other. I just said something like, we've made it, mate, we've done it, uh, we're all right now, that type of thing. But I can remember laughing a lot, which was obviously just the adrenaline and the relief just flowing through us. At the time, I remember us shouting at each other. I'm surprised they didn't hear us in the aircraft or we were screaming that loud. But, uh, it was just a feeling of relief that we realised that we'd got away with it, we'd done it.
The first thing that sort of hit me when we got into the doorway was the eyes of the last of the sort of three or four passengers that we picked up, they had eyes like dinner plates. They had actually, talking to them later on, had seen the ship disappearing and had actually seen us jumping over the side field where they were sat in the doorway. As they flew back to Plymouth, one of the Marie's officers, Irfan Jaffrey, used what English he had to write a special thank you on one of the life jackets. It read, to the angels who come in the guise of men, the Lord has chosen thee to perform the most profound of his miracles, saving life. You are what the world was made for. And how somebody can think about that sort of thing after what we'd just gone through, I thought was magnificent. Words are not enough. It's because uh, we keep hearing and we keep reading off and on about the storms and rescues. And uh, we read that so many people were saved by so and so. So you think, well, we've got brave men, all right. But when you see it, then you know. They have given us a second life. And I personally feel that everybody is very emotional on the, on the incident, what happened, and of course, the bravery shown by the crew members. You can't forget what humans can do for one another. You can't uh, get over that. Still to come on 999, the jogger with half an hour to live and the helicopter pilot who had to land within... It's time to kill...